<laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is the first Sunday where I'm officially actually preaching. Hallelujah. Woo, woo. <laughs> where we've, after we've decided to start a church. So it's fun. And Hannah made this beautiful little PowerPoint. It's gorgeous. So thank you very much for doing that. She's got some of the Bible verses so that for those of you who didn't bring your Bibles to church. Yeah. Well, I feel like you're <laughs> hand, but you know. We're, <laughs> what do I know? I'm just kidding. Um, they're not in that. <laughs> they're going to display all the beautiful words for you guys right on this screen. Um, I do recommend taking notes in church. I always think it's a good idea, especially if you're going to share this with somebody afterward, right? We're going to be about discipleship, and it's important to be able to share what you learn. So today we're going to talk, as promised, about identity. We're going to start there. I don't know how long we're going to stay on identity because I also want to talk about worship. I also want to talk about prayer. I also want to talk about the fruits of the Spirit, which I might do under the umbrella of identity, so we'll see. Um, but today we're talking about identity. Um, so what do you guys think identity is? What do you think of yourself? What do you think of yourself? That's a good one. Anybody else? Who people think you are? Who people? Who other people think you are? Okay. Yeah. Sound Hebrew. Sound Hebrew. Anybody else? So we've got who you think you are, who other people think you are. Anything else in terms of identity? Who God says you are. Who God says you are. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's the pastor's wife. <laughs> she is. She's beautiful. Thank you, sweetheart. You're welcome. You know, I was doing some studying on identity, and I absolutely love this concept of what identity truly is. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of definitions in the Oxford Dictionary, and then I'm going to go to the root Hebrew word and give you the definition there. So Oxford definition says, uh, number one, the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. Okay, I'll say that again. The fact, so fact being a reality, of being who or what a person or thing is. Okay? Uh, the second one is a close similarity or affinity. I found that one very interesting. So the definitions of identity, I'll go over them one more time. One, the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. And two, a close similarity or affinity. Now when we talk about identity, we often think in terms of you, or if you're thinking of yourself, me. Okay? If I think identity, I think who am I, what am I about? I, I personally, I don't know about everybody else, but I don't always personally think I am who other people or who someone else is but subconsciously we actually make that connection yeah. um, I'm gonna go with the Hebrew word for identity which I'm correct me if I'm wrong mr. Hebrew man is Zehut. that's how it's pronounced um, I had to google how to pronounce it because all there was was spelling and I did not know how to pronounce the squiggly lines <laughs> in the English uh, the phonetic the phonetic writing is Z E H hyphen H-O-O-T, which literally translate this-ness. This-ness? This hyphen ness. Oh, it's from the root word zay, which is, I believe, I didn't even write down what the root word meant. My apologies. Or this, sorry, I did write down. The word zay means this. Okay? So the root word for identity is this, and together, zehut means thisness. What is that talking about? That is an incredibly vague way of looking at identity. If I said, your identity is thisness, who here knows what that means? Hey? I would need context. You would need context, right? What if I told you that the context of your identity is based on you? You see, one of the things that I love about identity is God created us as human beings to literally attach ourselves to something. 
the best version of this is God literally created us to attach ourselves to Him. We are created as human beings to be attached to Him. But if we just, and that's why identity is so important, because if we don't have our identity, our thisness, this being Christ, but you notice the root word doesn't say Godness. Why do you think that is? Why doesn't it say Godness rather than thisness? It's because God created us as human beings to be able to identify with something, but He didn't force us to identify with Him. We can literally tie our identities to anything we want to. So what are some things that we tie our identities to? Think about it. Um, if I were to say, who is Matthew Gorley? Or if I were to say, who is Roger Benoit? I know when I was marrying, or I was trying to marry my wife, I went in to her father's kitchen, and my wife so blessedly left me in the room with him. He said, we're going shopping. Have a good chat. They left. Me alone in the room with him. He sits me down at the kitchen table, and the first words out of his mouth are, why are you wasting oxygen in my house? <gasps> you didn't think this would be online, but it is. <laughs> His first words were, what are you doing in my house? Who is Jeremiah? I began to describe what I did. I began to describe my job. I began to describe my relationship with God. I began to describe the fact that I was, you know, a good caretaker. I, could have, I had a job that could take care of my wife. I had a vehicle. I had a home. I had everything I needed to be able to steward a wife well. Yes, it's my responsibility to steward my wife to make sure that she has a home, a family, people around her, and someone to love and support her. But I started describing these things about me, and he said, no, 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 who are you? And I honestly, the only answer I could come up with to that question is I'm a child of God. It's the only answer I could come up with, and realistically, in my mind, that's the best answer. I <laughs> said, so that's all you're getting. <laughs> he kind of just looked at me like, okay, that's good. <laughs> and then we started cooking cheeseburgers together. It was a fantastic day. Because um, he said yes. <laughs> but what I love about it is we often, when somebody asks us who we are, we often tie our identities to something that we're really good at. People with perfectionist mentalities usually never try something new because they tie their identity to anything that they do. It's true. I was, it's, it, I, yeah. It's true. I, well, I was a guy who grew up with a perfectionist mentality. I would not sing unless I could do it perfect. I would not practice my instrument in front of people unless I was perfect. I would not do anything unless I could be excellent at it, and it irritated the snot out of me every time I made a mistake. That was me fighting and struggling through a perfectionist mentality. Finally, God had to send someone into my life and say, I don't care if you suck. Come on and try it, because if you don't suck at first, you'll never get better. It's very rare that you can start being perfect at something. You have to start somewhere. But I tied my identity to what I could do, and therefore, if I tied my identity to something that I did that I didn't do well, my identity now looked poor. It did not look good because my identity was tied to this and I know I'm good at this but I failed at this and so now my identity sucks. You can do this in business, you can do this in church, you can do this in, in your recreational things. I used to get so frustrated at paintball when I didn't end up killing or shooting at least three or four people. Not killing. Like too many video games. But when, in, in paintball when you're playing elimination I got upset if I didn't take out at least half of the other team. That was my goal. I wanted to be, I wanted to more than pull my weight. And when I couldn't do that, or I came up against somebody that was much better than me in the beginning, it didn't end well. I, got, I beat myself up. I got scared. I did things that, you know what? That's a very physically painful experience. But the principles in that are very true. When we come up against something in life that looks a little bit too big for us, we cower, we hide, we stay where we're comfortable. When I was playing paintball and I was first learning at Battle Challenge, I was the guy hiding behind the bunker that never moved. And if you know anything about military tactics, if you do that, 
you are a prime target to get taken out by somebody who is moving. You always want to be moving forward. You never want to be stagnant because what happens is, is they can pin you. In, in paintball terms, if you get pinned and they're moving up on you while you're pinned, you, can, you are literally powerless to get moving again until you can get an edge. This is literally how things work in life. If you end up saying, like, let's say God called you to do something. For me, it was pastoring. I waited a long time before I actually started pastoring. God told me to. I didn't listen. And it took years and years and people coming up and saying, when are you going to start a church? And then I was obedient. But you know what? There was part of me that said, you know, you may not be good enough to do this, to lead people, to do all of that. And so my identity wasn't solid in, you know what, it doesn't matter how good I am compared to other people, it's who God says I am. So I want to ask you guys, I'm going to give you guys some points. How do we attach our identities to something? How does that happen? How is it that we, I'm going to give you three things that we commonly do to, whether consciously or subconsciously, tie our identities to something. So the first one is our pursuit, okay? What we pursue is how we tie our identities to something. We identify with whatever we pursue where we spend our thought and physical time. So our thought time and our physical time is where we tie our identities to often. For example, when I first met Matthew, I said, hey Matt, who, what are you about? I'm a computer, I'm a, I'm a web designer, da, da 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 so on and so forth. And Matthew describes who he is by what he does. That's a sales technique. You walk into the door, you try and build rapport, and you tell people by attempting to build confidence with them by telling you what you are good at. Fair statement? Um, let's go to Proverbs 1, 10 to 15. Proverbs 1, verses 10 to 15. I'm going to tie this into identifying with things. So, my son, if sinners entice you, I'm going to just close this because the glare is making it impossible for me to read that. Okay. Yeah. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast your lot among us, and let us all have one purse. Keep your foot from their path. Keep your foot from their path is, is essentially the warning. Don't go after these guys. So I decided to do a little bit of research, and I looked into what does it mean to cast your lot. Okay, Cast your lot literally means to identify with someone. It means to take thisness. So whatever your thisness is, and this, it's talking about identifying with, with all of these things. So thieves, robbers, and murderers. We all know that the enemy comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Okay, so these are servants of who? Satan. Satan. Beautiful. Good connections. If we decide that we're going to identify with those things, that means our thisness becomes what their thisness is. You see how that works? Our pursuits. It says, keep your foot from their path. Don't even dabble in what they want. There's another Bible verse in Proverbs that says, do not envy evil men. How many times have we looked at somebody who's rich, famous, um, has lots of money, has lots of power, lots of beautiful cars, whatever they have, and we think, oh man, I wish I had that lifestyle. How do we know that that person is good? You could be envying an evil man whose identity is tied to all of those things. Did you know that North America has the highest suicide rate in all of the world? Mostly because of the fact, and they're tying it to the fact that they also have the most, they also have the most riches. When you tie your identity to the riches and the riches disappear, the Proverbs talks about riches coming and going. They can come and then be gone the next day. And if you have all those riches and they're gone the next day and that was what your identity is tied to, now what do you do? You give up. They've tied their identity, their, who they are, to something that isn't eternal. Okay? Um, number two, our habits. We can easily tie our identities to what we do regularly. Okay? 
Um, I used to play dodgeball on a weekly basis. Every Tuesday night, I would go and play dodgeball for two hours, and I would go and throw balls at people. It was probably one of the most satisfying times of my week, other than my times with God, because if I had a frustrating week or a frustrating day, I could literally take it out with these soft, squishy rhino balls, and you just toss them at people. It was a lot of fun. Throw them, whip them, whatever you need to do. So you know what happened is I eventually tied my identity to that thing, and when I wanted to leave dodgeball, when I got married, because I wanted to spend more time with my wife for a season, it was hard for me because I had tied my identity to something that I do regularly. Like, I'm a dodgeball player. This is what I do. I've tied myself to this thing. Now, that's a rather harmless thing like dodgeball. But what happens if we tie our identity to something that's a little less harmless? If we tie our identities to something that is going to be what we would call a bad habit. Something that draws us further from God rather than closer to Him. You know, I never, when I first joined Dodgeball, I never did it with the intent of creating a habit. I just did it because I thought, oh my gosh, I did this in high school, this could be fun as an adult, and I decided to go for it. Eventually, I did it every week, so long, for like five years, I didn't even realize five years had come up. And then all of a sudden it was a habit. It was like there was an expectation in me to be there. There was an expectation from others to be there. I've tied my identity to something. Dodgeball is a harmless thing. But what is it that you have tied your identity to that's a habit, that's something that maybe other people look up to you, but it's not where God has called you to? Because you can have a habit that's good, that's not, maybe not good. I'm not going to use the word good. You can have a habit that's not harmful, but it's not from God. Because remember, your identity, literally translated when we talk about identity in the Old Testament, is thisness, is this is who you are wanting to be tied to what you do. We're going to talk a little bit about the difference between, an, between a habit and a discipline. We're going to talk about that at the end. So we got first our pursuits, what we go after. We saw it here. If you go after the wrong things, it's going to end badly for you. Um, our habits we identify with and what we do regularly. I want to I want to spend one more one more little bit of time on our thought time. This is important. Our thought time is very 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 important because when you meditate on something, the Word of God says to meditate on things that are good, holy, pure. Okay. When we meditate on things that are not good, that are not holy, that are not pure. When we meditate on the problems of our of what we're going through, rather than than the than the things that God has promised and where we want to tie our identity to, we're gonna find that where we've tied our identity is what we start to look like. That's true. Out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. But it's life and death and the power of the tongue. So if our identity is tied to anything other than God, we're speaking death every time we open our mouths. Which leads us into number three, giving into temptation. This is the third thing that can help, that can tie our identities to something. Our temptations can always attach themselves to our identities if we give in to them. Now, we sometimes think as Christians, well, we're not going to get tempted. I'm saved. All of this happens. You know what? You are going to experience temptation your entire life. Get used to it. If you thought Christian walking was easy, you should take a baking. <laughs> we are going to experience Christian walk or er, temptation every single day of our lives. It says that we need to resist the devil and he will what? Now, if if that Bible verse stands true, that we're supposed to resist the devil and he will flee, flee that means that there is a time when he's tempting us. Otherwise, there would be nothing to resist. So we need to understand that when we're resisting the devil, we don't necessarily, it doesn't say that you need to rebuke him. It doesn't say that you need to do all of these things. In that one particular Bible first, there are times where you do need to rebuke the enemy, and we'll go into that at some point. But resisting the devil and he will flee applies beautifully to temptation. Because what happens to temptation when you don't give in? 
What happens to those thoughts? Anybody ever beat a temptation thought? It goes away. Which means that that temptation was not from God. That temptation was from the enemy, and when you resisted it, God's word stood true, and it left. You know what also left? That tie to your identity. I've got, I'm going to do a quick little, um, what do you call it? I got object lesson. Because I thought it would be really cool. So I got three glasses of water here. Now, I've often talked about water being um, integrity, which is wholeness. If you look at the word integrity in the Hebrew, it literally means whole, okay? It means all together. It means you, no matter which angle you're looking at, you're going to see what you need to see. If I were to hold this glass of water up, and I asked all of you to describe what water, what this water is, there is nobody here in their right mind that would call this blue. There is nobody here that would say it's pink, orange, solid. There is nobody here that would, would be able to describe this water as anything other than what it is, clear and refreshing. H2O, you can do whatever you want, but it's really easy to describe, fair enough? Now, if these are our identities, I'm not going to go too much into the other side of this because sometimes we have two identities. One that we show to people we want to be around and then the one that is actually who we are. So the fake people who come to church and say, you know what, I'm going to look like a Christian on Sunday and then the rest of the day they're dirty water. That's not an identity. Your identity is the one you do when you're not putting on a show. The rest is all fake. So if this is your identity, this Let's tie this to your identity. This is your thisness. God made you a clear, empty vessel. Okay? Free will, choice, do whatever you want. You can literally add almost anything you want to water and it'll turn into something. Okay? So I've got two different objects here. Okay? I'll show you what they are in a second. If this is a representation of who you are, certain things are going to adhere better to water than others. Is that a fair statement? We were created by God to be in touch with God, which means that when we tie our thisness to Him, it melds beautifully. It's normal. It's what God has actually designed our bodies to do. It's going to produce health. It's going to produce prosperity. It's going to produce life. It's going to mix very, very well. And at the very end, once you've had enough of God and he's poured out and he's done everything he needs to do and you've decided I'm going to tie everything I am to God, you actually get a really refreshing drink of iced tea. No, what you really get at the very end is somebody who can refresh, who can be the salt of the earth and the light of the earth. You get somebody who can walk the way God has intended them to walk. Would anybody here drink this? Yeah? It would, be, it would be pleasing to most people, unless you're sugar fasting, but in general, this is pretty good, pretty good water, right? pretty good to drink. Who wants this? Sure. Take him get it. Yeah. There you go. Somebody wanted it. No surprise there. Now let's take what the world has to offer. Let's try mixing this up. Mmm, yummy. Who wants some of this? Anybody? No takers? Nobody wants to chug a good old-fashioned cup of dirt? Mixed with water. Ooh, it's nice and murky. Chunks of, like, grossness in here. What is that? Lovely. See, God had a plan. He said, I designed you in my image. He said, I created you to be able to tie yourself 
anywhere you want. But your your highest purpose was to tie yourself to me. So I'm going to give you guys a few things. We're going to go into how to identify with Christ. Because you know what? Everybody wants to be that cup of iced tea. That thing is gone. You chug that thing. That's awesome. We aren't called to be on this earth for our own purposes. We're called to go out and to add value to others, to share the gospel, to preach the kingdom, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to do all of these different things, to preach the gospel. How can we do that if we've tied ourselves to things that nobody wants to partake of? If you are full of God, people will want to partake. If you're full of crap, nobody wants that. But you know what's interesting? I'm not trying to be racist here. But this is a reality that we face. There are people in Africa who would drink this because there's nothing else to drink. Mm -hmm. When you are so thirsty and you don't have clean water, you will drink whatever is put in front of you. How many of us have not have lost track of who God called us to be, and we are like, God, my life is in so much trouble. I don't know what I'm going to do. My finances are falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. My home is falling apart. I, this, there's water in front of me. I, I should just partake of this. And then you start drinking into things that aren't from God. You start listening to people whose marriages are fail about how to live a good, healthy marriage. You start listening to people who are in debt about how to get out of debt. You start listening to people who have broken relationships about how to build good, healthy relationships. What are you drinking from? We should be able to, as Christians, look and take a seat what someone's identity is tied to. It's really easy. God gave us the tools. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What do people say? What do they do? How do their lifestyles live? So how do we identify with Christ? How do we figure out how to go for the iced tea rather than the mur murky dirt water? How do we do that? Step one, discipline your pursuit. Very specifically, I use the word discipline because it's not always easy or humanly natural to go for what God has for us. What God had isn't something that our bodies naturally want to do. Fasting is not something our bodies naturally want to do. Reading and praying is not something our bodies naturally want to do. It's something our spirit men crave. It's something our mind and soul can make sense of but it's not something our body wants. Our body wants to go have sex in the street, eat as much as we can, and then kill people. Think about it. Anytime you have a civilization without God, there's war, sex, and, and everything else that you could possibly think of that doesn't produce life. Let's go to Proverbs 9, 10 to 11. I love that this is up here. That is so nice. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. So wisdom, the actual word for wisdom, is chakma in Hebrew. It means chakma? Okay, chakma. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Hebrew man. Chakma. It means understanding, comprehension, and insight. Okay? If you want to be able to identify with who Christ is, you have to have a good understanding of who he is. If you don't have a, base, a basic understanding that you know what? God is holy. Here's the thing. Identity means to create what is a blank canvas and to tie it to something. So if you want to really tie it to God, you need to understand God is holy. You need to understand God has grace. God has mercy. God has judgment. You, well, Christians aren't supposed to judge. Yes, they are. They're just supposed to judge after they've taken care of the, themselves. You're allowed to, you're called to judge 
You're not called to judge as a hypocrite. There's a difference. But you are called to live holy lives so that you can help others live holy lives. That's how we're supposed to live. So you have to have a good understanding of who God is if you want to properly identify with him. If I were to tell you to go and find those two substances somewhere in our house, but I never showed them to you beforehand, you wouldn't know what you're looking for. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between iced tea powder and dirt. You could be searching and searching and searching, and yes, there is a chance you might get lucky and find the right answer. But if you don't know who God is, and I say you might get lucky because there are people who know nothing about God and live by a lot of godly principles, like giving. That's a godly principle. Like being kind. That's a godly principle. You can, you can happen upon these things and, and, and have those aspects of your life that are good and the rest is still crap. So let me give you an example. If I were to add a couple teaspoons of iced tea to this bad boy, the good stuff, who would want it? Still nobody? No takers? Why is that? Because as much good as you have, if you still have evil in it, it's not good. That's true. If your identity isn't fully tied to Christ, and you know what, there is a way to do this. By grace we are saved, which means that God can essentially erase this and turn you back into this so that you can be tied to Christ. But that takes a choice, that takes repentance, and we'll get into that. But to identify with him requires a discipline. Now, do you guys know the difference between discipline and a habit? Discipline can get you to a habit, but a habit isn't always formed by a discipline. Discipline is doing something over and over and over again that you may or may not want to actually do, but you know is good for you. For example, eating healthy. Not eating 10 chocolate chip cookies when you go to your friend's house. Hey now. <laughs> it was six. <laughs> Discipline is when you choose you make a choice, you weigh the options, and you say, this is where I'm going, and I'm going to pursue it. A good, op a good example of discipline is if you have to go to the gym. I used to go to the gym without knowing what to do at the gym. That made making a discipline of it very difficult. I'd go, and some days I would like fiddle with the arm ones because I wanted to have cool arm muscles. And then I didn't do anything with my back because I thought that was not important. Who cares what your back looks like? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't see it. I can't see it, so nobody else can see it clearly. You can't see me. But you know what? If you aren't informed on what you're doing when you try to create your discipline, you're going to create bad habits in a good discipline. Mm -hmm. How many Christians have really bad habits pursuing a good discipline? How many people have decided, you know what, I'm going to pursue God, but out of my pursuit for God, I'm going to just put the word to the side. I just want the spear. Or how many times do we take it and we say, I'm done away with that spirit, that's not really for today, I'm going to take just the word. How many times do we create bad, dis or bad habits in the pursuit of good disciplines? What's one of the things that you need to create a good discipline? Self-control. Self-control, that's a beautiful one. What, what else do we got? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Desire. Desire. Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is huge. What is something that we can control? Ourselves. Ourselves. Something that's not a gift from God that is super important when you're forming a discipline. Our flesh. Our flesh is part of it, I'm going to say consistency. How often did Jesus go into the garden to pray? How, how often did Jesus separate himself from every single day in the morning? He separated himself 
from what? From the world. Jesus did this, okay? The guy who, who started off with all of these different miracles, who theologians say if we were to record all of his miracles, the book would be way too big to carry around. This guy had to separate himself daily. That's a discipline. How many Christians don't take time to sit and deal with yourself? It's always give, 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 give. But what you, I'm going to give you a principle that changed my life when I learned this. You can't give something you don't have. Literally, you cannot give it. You can think you can give it. You can be deceived into giving it. But you can't give something you don't currently have. And so, if you aren't constantly going to the Father and being filled, filled, because what happened with Matt drink? Matt's drink, he drank it all. It's an empty cup. Can you get, can I, can Matt give that to anybody else once he's emptied his cup? No. He can't. So what does he need to do? Well, exactly what he did do. He went and refilled his cup. If you want more iced tea powder, I can give you that too. But he ended up refilling it so that he could to partake or give some more. We as Christians need to learn the disciplines of how to identify, if we're going to identify with Christ, we need to see that Christ had disciplines in his life. We need to see that Jesus himself took time alone with the Father, do we? Do we take time alone with the Father? Some of us do some of one and not the other. Some of us do lots of one and not the other. I used to be a guy who always was giving and didn't ever take enough time inside to refill. And then I switched, where I got to the point where I was taking in lots, but I wasn't giving it because I felt like I didn't have a venue. I didn't have somewhere to sew it. If you don't have somewhere to sew it, go stand on a street corner and start telling people about Jesus. Go to your workplace and say, hey, can I tell you about this cool guy I know? Wear a t-shirt that says, y'all need Jesus, and walk into a parade of people, and just walk like this, and see who stops you. So number one was discipline your pursuit. There's a difference between a habit and a discipline. Um, you, can, you can create a habit through discipline, but you do not need discipline to create a habit. So the key here is to find discipline. Um, number two. So number one, again, discipline your pursuits. How to identify with Christ. Number two, find out who God is. Let's go to Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not just the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness, you know what that, you know what that word is? To be in right standing with God. Okay, so seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We're talking about the very basics here. If you go back and you read what Matthew is talking about, he's talking about stuff like food, clothing, the basic needs of a human. He's saying if you do this first, all these things will be added unto you. What is that telling you? If I'm going to identify and line myself up with who God is, the thisness and create an identity, I need to realize that this is more important than food, water, and, and sleeping, and clothing. That's what Matthew's saying here. He's saying, if you have nothing else but God, that is still more important. There's another Bible verse that says, it's not worth it to gain the whole world and lose your soul. Do we identify with that? So, um, let's go to Romans ten seventeen. How do we find out who God is? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay? This is talking about a pursuit. Daily listening, and listening, and listening, and listening. It's repeated. When things are repeated, there's emphasis on things, which means you need to be hearing, and hearing, and hearing. Can you hear a Bible? can if you slam it shut or throw it at somebody. You can't hear a Bible. Who is he talking about? He's not talking about hearing the, just the Bible. He's saying you need to be hearing God. 
You need to be in communion, common union with God. Set apart, which is the word consecration, means to literally set apart. You need to be spending time with God and hearing who He is by the Word of God. It's not saying hear the Word of God by the Word of God, which means everything you're hearing can be judged and weighed and filtered through the Word of God. This is how we're supposed to get to know who Christ is. We sometimes come to church, we sit down, we have our Bibles, we pull it out so we look good in church. Look at me, I got a Bible. You listen to what the preacher says, and you go home, and you haven't actually read what any of this says. You're taking what he says at point blank value. Now, I do this every time I preach. Whenever I'm taking just a single Bible verse, I go and I read everything around it to make sure that the context fits. You can do this with all of these and you'll find that what I'm talking about, the principles I'm drawing from them fit. Don't take my word for it. Go study these. That's why taking notes is important. Because here's the deal. I'm going to show you what I know about the Word of God from my perspective. Now there are truths. There are truths that we get. <laughs> That's a nice creaky door. There are truths that we have that are absolute. Okay? Things that will not change from Christian to Christian. I just started writing in I just started writing my the first part of my book yesterday. I'm really excited about that, by the way. And you guys should be too. It'll be really good. Part of the part that I was talking about the book is if you take twelve people and you place them where all the numbers should be on a clock around an elephant. I'm talking about perspective. Every single person in that room is going to be able to describe the elephant. But if somebody's at 6 o'clock and the elephant's facing 12 o'clock, you're going to get a good rear end view of that elephant. And so your description of that elephant is going to be very different than the guy at 12 o'clock, right? Does that mean that the guy at 12 o'clock is wrong? Not at all. Does that mean the guy at 6 o'clock is wrong? Not at all. They're both describing something about the truth, okay? Now let's say, for example, we pull that elephant out, we put a chicken in. Or maybe something bigger, a hippo. And I say, guys, describe the elephant. Now everybody starts describing this and they say, no, the elephant's like this. No, the elephant's like this. No, the elephant's like this. They're all giving these accurate descriptions of something that's not the truth. See, the enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to take something that's the truth and he wants to replace it with mud. Something that looks like it could be the truth, but isn't. And so, and then he says, the, the term today is we need to be diverse in our thinking. And they back it up with the Bible verse that says, God gives, brother for a, God gives a brother for diversity. Here's the thing. True diversity means people studying one truth. Not a whole bunch of people studying the wrong, like something that's not a truth, a non-truth. If you want to take what the Bible says, take it in full context. God never intended you to go out and study what a hippo looks like when you've been told to study an elephant. That's just a quick analogy in terms of that. But we'll keep moving along. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the Word of God. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Can you actually tie your identity to someone without having faith that he exists? Without having faith of who he is? At the very end of this, we're going to talk about boldness, between the difference between boldness and a victim mentality, and then we're going to get a chance to pray with you guys. But I want you to catch this, because if you don't know who God is, you can't defend why you do what you do. If you don't know why you're in a room studying an elephant, why are you there? What's the point? You don't have purpose without God. If your purpose is to make a million dollars, once you've made a million dollars, you no longer have purpose. If your purpose is to have a home and a family and a car before you get married and you achieve that, and then now all of a sudden you have no more purpose. 
If your purpose is to have children and a family, once you have your children and a family, they grow up and move out, you no longer have purpose. But if your purpose is, I'm going to serve God through the buying of a home, through the creating of a family, through the going through finances and making a million dollars, then even when you achieve those little micro goals along the way, your purpose still remains because it was all for a greater purpose, which is what God calls you to. Does God call you to make millions of dollars? Some people. Not everybody can handle a million dollars. Look at the proverb that Jesus said. He gave the talents. One, two, and five. Because God knew the guy with one isn't going to handle five. The guy with five, his talents would be wasted with one. And he was right because the guy with one failed. God called him a wicked servant. You're like, God, I really want more power. I want to heal. I want to do all these things. And God's saying, if I dump all of this power on you right now, with the character you currently have, your wineskins explode, you self-destruct, and I lose you completely. God never, ever gives you more than you can handle. When he talks about that with temptation, he says, I'm never going to tempt you with more than you can handle. You don't think power is a temptation? If, if I could call down fire from heaven and watch it burn down the city, and I saw an evil city, there would be temptation. <laughs> the disciples came to Jesus we can burn a city down like Elijah calling fire on those prophets and Jesus like whoa now we don't do that right now that's not the spirit I came in we can have access to all of those things as Christians but if we don't have our basic identities tied to who Christ is the power that follows the thing that identifies us as Christians won't be there You see, in the New Testament, certain people got baptized with the Holy Spirit before they even knew who God was. Some of the Gentiles. You see, you know what the, Gen you know what the Jews did? They're like, oh my gosh, we've got to tell them about God because you know what? They don't know who He is yet. And so what do they do? They educate them on where their power came from. Because if you have, not, not to quote Uncle Ben in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Yes, I quote Spider-Man. It's a good quote. But if you don't have, if you don't take responsibility for the giftings and talents that God gave you, it might not be right now where you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. But if you have a gifting for music, put your time into it. If you have a gifting for people and understanding people, start developing that. Learn how to lead, learn how to speak, learn how to communicate. If you have a gifting for computers, start teaching yourself and learning because you don't know what God's called you to do. You don't have to be a great public speaker to be used hugely by God. There are a lot of great movie productions out there that wouldn't be where they are without a good Christian producer. There are a million things out there that God can use and you never know what they are. But if you decide in your heart, I'm just going to give up because I can't see the future because I've tied my identity to this thing that I'm good at and that's where I'm staying, rather than to God who's always moving, always changing, always stretching, you're never going to move forward. So number one, discipline your pursuit. Number two, find out who God is. And number three, renew your mind. Let's go to Romans 12, 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the perfect will of God. I love this Bible verse. I picked this particular translation um, when I saw it over the New King James, which is what I've been preaching out of, because I love these two words. It's testing and discern. Okay? Sometimes we think that it's going to be a cakewalk to be a Christian, but you, God is going to allow testing. Uh, some people would call this wilderness seasons, depending on where you're at or what church you go to. But if you are going to be tested, so you can discern. Can you discern without being tested, according to this?
How many of you guys would like to be operated on a doctor who's never been tested? Or operated on by, yeah, by a doctor who's never been tested? Wouldn't be very good, would it? Probably you'd end up with like an intestine coming out your ear or whatever. You never know what goes out, what comes in. Why would God send one of his soldiers out who's never been tested? And give him the ability to discern. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed literally means you go from this to this. Where God can now pour what's good into you. Transformed is a literal, it's a literal act of what's happening in your spirit, man. It's getting rid of garbage and doing and putting in the new. Um, I can't remember what the terminology is. Water displacement theory. If I were to take a tap of water and just let it drip in here for weeks and 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 weeks, and weeks, and weeks did you know that that's transforming this cup? Eventually, if all I'm doing is adding little bits of clean water to this cup, it's going to displace all of this muck. It's going to overflow out of the cup, and this will be clean water. See, we sometimes expect God to just come and dump the cup out, and then put all the new stuff in, and all of a sudden we're perfect, and we think that's what it means to be transformed. It's instantaneous. All those desires, temptations, and tests disappear. But God is more about the journey and the process than your destination. I heard this beautifully, that God is a God of moments, not time. Those moments with Him are what change you, not the amount of time you spend. One uh, that we, we talked about it this morning in prayer, Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. God deals in moments. Do not be conformed to this world. Conformed, don't tie your identity to this world. But be transformed. So, which means if you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, it means that we start with our minds being part of the world, our identity being tied to something other than God. That's where you start. Because if that wasn't where you started, there'd be no need for transformation. Transformation means to take something that was one thing and to turn it into something completely different. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the perfect will of God. If you can discern what is the perfect will of God, this is what Jesus could do. If you can discern what the perfect will of God is, you can run your way, your race and win it every single time. Will you still be tested? Yes. Was Jesus tested? Yes. Will you still be persecuted? Yes. Why? Jesus was persecuted. Is there a chance you may die? Yes, but that's a sacrifice he's willing to make. Will you right? It literally is, though. God is more interested in your long-term salvation and what you do on earth than what you do or what you do with your few years because of what's going to happen after those few years than the fact that you might live comfortably for the hundred years you're on life on earth. Don't live comfortably. I made a statement once in youth group when I was a youth pastor that your comfort zone comes from the devil. Because it's like a box. The devil's like, ooh, look, you're comfortable here. Let's put you in a box. And we're going to make that box nice and cozy. We're going to put couches in there. We're going to put a coffee machine. We're going to put you everything you need. Basic living needs. You see, the devil can supply some things too. Because the devil can't beat the power of God. But he can distract you. I'm going to put some basic needs. Make you nice and comfortable. I'm going to sit you in a spot where you're good. And you had God's like, no, I need you to break out. And I need you to go do something completely unrational and crazy. And it's going to blow your mind. Can we do that? Are we willing to tie our identities to something that is so out of this world? We've often, I'm gonna, I'm guilty of this. I have been guilty of this, and I'm still finding that there's aspects of my life that is tied to North American culture rather than kingdom culture. I'm learning to break these things off, but like, um, I'm gonna give you an example of a testimony I heard. This woman was pleading with God, I need to know who you are, I, I, but I don't know if you're real. 
So she went out into this public square or whatever. She said, God, if you're real, someone's going to stand up on that fountain and dance and cluck like a chicken. <laughs> she made this statement. And this Christian guy's walking by, and God stops him and says, I need you to go up on that fountain and cluck like a chicken. And the guy's like, I don't think so, God. And God's like, no, I need you to go up there. I need you to do it now. Why? Just do it. No. Yes, go do it. He argued with God, but after a little while, he got up on this fountain and started dancing like a chicken. And then as he's dancing, he sees this woman break down, burst into tears, and start crying. So then God's like, go see her. I'm getting emotional talking about this, but it was so cool. So he goes down, and she just starts bawling. She says, I said if you're real, God, some, I told God if someone's real, this needs to happen. And that guy went and did it. You did it. What God told you to do, you need to tell me about this Jesus. You need to do, you need to come in and, and show me how to do this. That woman got led to Christ that day, radically transformed to find out who God was. But that person tied his identity to who God is, and not what the not what culture says is acceptable. It's not culturally acceptable to dance on a thing, on a on a on a fountain and clap like a chicken. But in God's kingdom. When he saw what that person needed, it was there. For me, God told me to pick up a hitchhiker who wanted to hitchhike from one end of the city to the other, and I said, God, that never happens. I'm like, tell you what, if you make it happen, I'll do it. Two days later, two or three days later, I'm driving and there's a dude in the city with his hand thumb out like this. I said, You gotta be kidding me. I pulled over, picked him up. Where are you going? I'm just going to the other side of the city. Great, hop in, I'll take you. He didn't want to call a cab to pick up his car from the Rook Mechanic Shop, so he needed a ride, and he decided to hitchhike down. Did I get to tell that guy about Jesus? No, the opportunity didn't arise, and I didn't feel like the Holy Spirit told me to, but what he did tell me was, you cannot underestimate the silly things that I tell you to do. What doesn't seem conventional is often what God uses to dumbfound the wise. So renewing your mind is a big part of it. All right. So those are the two. I'm going to recap for you. There's three things that tie our identity to something. Our pursuit, our habits, giving into temptation. How to identify with Christ. One is discipline your pursuit. Two is find out who God is. Three, renew your mind. We could go on to all of these topics and talk for hours, but I'm going to move on to one of the aspects of God. Okay? Let's go to Acts 28, 31. Alright. So preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. I'm going to read it to you in a different translation. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So, context. This is Paul having a chit-chat with a bunch of religious people fighting against a religious culture. He's arguing over the Gentiles. Because all the Jews are like, How dare you? They can't do this, da 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 whatever. And Paul's like, Uh-uh, this is what God said. Deal with it. And I love it because he wasn't shy or meek. He was bold. The aspect of God that I want to talk about today is boldness. Because without boldness, you really can't be an effective Christian. And when I say effective, I don't mean... you Like, you may be able to influence one person here or there. But true effectiveness isn't being able to do some good. It's being able to work at max capacity. If I buy a camera, and it's supposed to be able to record at 4K, and all I'm doing is 720p, for anybody who knows anything about that, if it's taking really crappy video, and we say it's good enough I'm still getting the video, that's not working at capacity. That's not doing what God called you to do. That's not good in God's eyes. He says, I called you to be 4K. I called you to be the best that you can be. Why and how dare you tell me that I didn't create you good enough for you to do more than what you're currently doing?
God has no intention of you operating at minimum capacity. I love what John Maxwell says. He says average is a square word. He says if you're going to be like everybody else, you might as well be nobody. Because what's the point? If you're going to look like everybody else, if you're going to be able to do 720 like every other camera out there, why did God create you to do 4K? Why did God create you specifically to reach homeless people? Or you to reach the, the rich people of the world? You know what? Sometimes Christians, we don't like to go after rich people because it's like, I don't want to go after the money. Rich people need Jesus too. It's just harder. Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. But that doesn't mean that they can't. How many times do we pick the easy route? Do we say, you know what, I'm operating at an okay capacity, I'm doing good, it's, it's not the best, but it's not great. That's not who God called us to. He called us to be bold. Let's go to Ephesians 3, 8 to, 2, 8 to 12. I'm gonna, this is a bit of one, so I'm going to read it through. To me, who am less than the least of all of the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to all eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. We have a mystery we're supposed to help solve. We have a mystery we're supposed to help unfold to the world. And it never once in there says that we need to do it without any boldness. He says, I'm giving you boldness and access. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence. Any of you ever messed up? Made a mistake? Yeah. Sin? You ever have that like that conscience feeling at the end where it's like, oh, you know what, I'm not good enough. You ever beat yourself up after you make a mistake? You know, the Bible says there is now no more condemnation. Condemnation was written, is it is an Old Testament way of looking at things. That's what, that's what Romans, that's what Paul talks about in Romans. There is now no more condemnation in Christ Jesus, which means that when you make a mistake, you don't stay there. Because here's the deal. When you are acting in condemnation, you're tying yourself to an identity that is no longer what God has for you. Who are you melding with? If you're a cup of water, what are you putting in? Your identity can't be based on anything other than what it was created for. It says, in the beginning, God created man and woman. God created them. Not Satan, not a random act of Big Bang, not anything else that is a wacko job theory out there. God created them. Man and woman. And so if God created them, and we look at Adam and Eve in the garden, he created them to what? Fellowship with them? To walk with them? He walked with them in the garden? He instructed them? He gave them jobs? As we saw Mike, Michael Todd talk, he gave them parameters? He gave them everything they needed to thrive in a relationship with God because God wanted them tied to Him. But what happened when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What happened to their identity? It got tied to something God never intended for them to be tied to. The thisness, they were, they were like God. They were thisness. They were tied to who He was. Their identity was completely tied to Christ. As soon as they tied their identity to this, it says they knew they were naked. How is that possible if it's not part of your identity? All of a sudden, your identity isn't... And I'm going to shift your, your focus for a sec. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Or not your focus, your perspective. It became about how they saw themselves rather than how God saw themselves. I'm going to say it again. Their identity became less about how God saw them and more about how they saw themselves because God said, who told you you were naked? God didn't tell them that. 
God, God's perspective is what they were tied to originally, and God never once mentioned it. But then all of a sudden they partake of the thing that God told them not to, and they tied their identity to something God never intended for them to take a part of. So why is it that we as Christians are doing that? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3.12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Did you know that hope brings about faith? And without faith it's impossible to please God. If you have no hope, you can't have faith. So therefore, since we have such hope, where does our hope come from? Jesus Christ dying on the cross, we are now saved. That's where our hope comes from. So therefore, now that we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. How many times, I can tell you personally, I've been in churches where the pastors will refuse to make bold statements because it might offend some people. It might hurt some feelings. It might mean some of your tithers leave your church. It might mean one of your worship leaders leaves your church. It might mean that when you call that dude out on the sin, that he's blatantly living in front of your congregation, that there's going to be a problem. But you know what? God never intended us to be nice. He intended us to be bold, or to use great boldness of speech, to be able to speak the truth in love. These are all biblical. If you are not willing to do what God has called you to do, don't be in leadership. Don't be a Christian. Go find something else to do. Jesus made this... You, you think I'm... That, that's not a harsh statement. Jesus, when he was preaching to this crowd, said, you will drink my blood and eat my bread, or eat my body. Half the crowd left him. Half. Half. So the, the picture this, you have a church of 100 people, all of a sudden 50 get up and walk out, never come back. Picture this, you're preaching to, you're, you're at work or whatever, you're the boss, you tell your employees, I'm a Christian, da, 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 da. this is what God says, you offend half of them and they walk out. Are you willing to lose half of your following for the sake of the gospel? The Bible says that they're going to be offended for my sake. Jesus said this, for my sake they will be offended. But if our identity, and here's the, oh, oh, this is you. Here's the thing. If you, as somebody who is receiving that, is tied to Jesus, there's no room for offense. You'll grow. If you, who is receiving the correction, is receiving the growth, is receiving the boldness of speech that's being spoken to you, are full of the Holy Spirit and are tied to Him in the right way, you won't get offended. Offense is for people who don't know God. You might be like hurt, you might be convicted. Don't confuse conviction with offense. Offense is something you take. Conviction is something that's given. Holy Spirit is the convictor. He convicts you. He'll tell you when you've done something wrong. This is good. It says the Father corrects those He loves. You want to be corrected? He loves you. Right. Proverbs says that a wise man who is, in, who is rebuked or corrected becomes wiser still. But a foolish man will scorn you for correction. Do you want to do you want to be around people who are foolish, who that you can't speak into their lives and watch them grow? Because if that's the case, according to the Bible, you're surrounding yourselves with fools. We aren't called to be surrounded by fools. We're called to surround ourselves and build up and disciple leaders. Discipling Jesus rebuked Peter right after he gave him a correction or a compliment. Hey, Jesus, I know who you are. Great! But now you can't die. Get behind me, Satan. He literally, from one sentence to another, he rebukes Peter, but Peter stays with him. Why? Because he's tied in the right way. His identity is firm in who Jesus is. I don't know why this keeps coming in, but 
I want you guys just to picture Velcro, another way of looking at it, and you're a chunk of Velcro. And everything that you bump into, you get something stuck to you. So the question is, what are you sticking to? Because the beautiful thing is, is if you're the piece of Velcro and the world revolves around you, you're going around and you're picking this thing up, 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 and you as a ball of Velcro is getting heavier and heavier and heavier. But if you know what happens when you get transformed is God wipes all of that off, and you as a little piece of Velcro get stuck to this massive God. And then wherever he goes, you're going. You can't, n none of those little garbage pieces are going to go near God, which means that if you're stuck to Him, nothing else can get stuck to you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Joshua 1.9. I'm going to ring this through. I Have I not commanded you? Question mark. This is a command from God. Be strong and courageous. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is literally a command from God to people. Be courageous, be bold. Well, Jeremiah, I don't know if I'm comfortable saying something like that, because what happens if I offend them and I turn them off of Jesus? Not your responsibility. You're responsible for being bold, courageous, and speaking the truth in love. You can be kind and gentle in how you speak, but your words are what they're going to need to have spoken to them so that when they walk away offended, Holy Spirit can come in and convict them in private. If you never speak the truth in love, I don't care how offended. They may go home happy, but they aren't going home convicted, which means they aren't changing. He's talking to Joshua here, by the way. For those of you who don't know, Joshua was an 80-year-old man when he took the promise of God by the horns and literally slaughtered armies as an 80-year-old farmer. That God loved. I love the story of Joshua because anybody who says I'm over 65 and I have an excuse to not be useful, sorry, you're wrong. You don't become less useful at 65. God used an 80 year old here. This is after God created the law of 120. But you know how you get to 120? You know, what the, you know what wisdom says? You know what Proverbs says? If you're going to get to 120, you have to live wisely and long life will be added to you. It's just simple, simple stuff. Let's go to the next one, 2 Corinthians 3.12. Isaac. Oh. Okay, that, that was the last one. Okay, so we switched. I have this one. Which one's that? Yeah, we'll go there next. So go back. Okay, so we've dealt with some boldness. Now I want to deal with something that is way, way, way too prevalent in North America today. It's called the victim mentality. I was blown away when God showed me where to find the victim mentality in Proverbs, but it is there. It's, it, it's, it's insane that we as Christians are not only okay with this, but we're actually fighting for it. Let's go to that. Proverbs 26, 13. The lazy man says there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion in the streets. He's talking about not being able to go outside. You know what this is? God showed me this. I can't succeed because somebody's out to get me. I can't succeed because outside circumstances are bigger than who I am. I can't help but think of the Black Lives Matter movement. What does it say about the people who say that? The lazy man. Lazy people blame their lack of success on other people, often that don't exist. It's a problem that the enemy, it's a lie that the enemy gives that says you can't succeed because if you try, you're going to fail. Proverbs addresses this lazy man, this, this victim mentality. And you know what? This isn't just about Black Lives Matter movements. You're going to find this in your Christian walk. Well, God, I really probably shouldn't go up there and dance like a chicken on that, on that fountain because, well, you know, somebody might take my picture and I'll lose credibility in my church because I look like a fool. That's the victim mentality. Well, God, I can't preach the truth in my church because my board members will fire me. 
So, are you afraid of what, what, what man can do, or are you afraid of what God can do? Do you have the fear of man or the fear of God? God never intended us to be walking around worried about what may or may not be out in the street. This is implying that there actually isn't anything out in the street. If you read the rest of this, the rest of this chapter, this is a man who won't want, who doesn't want to go to work, and blames the rest of the world for doing it. It irks me to no end when Christians stand up and say, "We need to fight for this. We need to fight for. We're going to go and protest." I love what Todd White said. That's whining. That's not fighting. That's not prayer. Prayer is how you fight. Lazy men don't eat like that. The Bible says that. Plain out simple. You don't eat if you're lazy. Don't expect the world if you aren't willing to put some effort in. But as Christians, let's bring that back to our identity. How does this tie in? Well, I'm not willing to step out because I don't know what could happen. I had this mentality. I said, I can't write a book because who in the world is going to listen to some young guy who has very little life experience tell them how to live their life. God had to shift that and say, it's not about you. I'm giving you revelation. I'm giving you knowledge. You're responsible to be obedient to me, not to worry about people who are going to hate you for it. Let's go to the next one. The wicked flee when no one pursues. But the righteous are bold as a lion. This is my last verse for today, but I, I want to paint this picture for you. They're running scared of nothing. Your fear is unfounded. It's based on somebody who's come to kill, steal, and destroy, but his main weapon is lies. And he can steal, kill, and destroy through his lies that you're being pursued. But what does it say about righteous people? They're bold as a lion. Have you ever seen a lion back down to anything? I haven't. I've seen predators walk by and a lion is chilling in the field and just watches him. Doesn't even care. Because why? He's the king of the jungle. You walk in such authority with the kingdom of God that if you actually applied yourself, the demons would know you by name and they would flee. Is this who you want to be as a church? The church of, Med of Medicine Hat, the church of Canada, the church of the world, the church of the kingdom of God, we're ambassadors. I'm gonna, I, I love this statement. Is you should actually see the very same principles of Christianity in every culture around the world because we're to adopt kingdom culture, not North American culture, not American culture, not Brazilian culture, not African culture. Kingdom culture. Jesus came to preach the kingdom. He taught this to Jews who had their own religious culture in that day. He said, drop your cultures Follow the kingdom culture. The one that is going to be established when I return. Start preparing for my return. We're the ambassadors that go forward. We're, back in the day, they didn't have news articles. They had criers. You ever know, know what a town crier is? They're the ones who would yell out, This is the news! Blah, 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 blah! Billy Bob died from falling off the haystack. This is the kind of thing that they used to have. We're supposed to go out and scream it from the rooftops. Are we bold enough to do that? To stand against anything that comes in our way? If you're in a position where you're under leadership, or, or maybe you are the leader and this is the problem, or you're in a spot where, you know what, you're stuck, you need to get out. You need to get out, get God, and then do what you're supposed to do. You might not be where you're called to be right now, which is why if you're not feeling fulfilled, if you're not feeling bold, if you're not feeling life flowing through you, if you're feeling trapped, this is a spot where you need to really pursue God and take your little fuzzy... Um, whatever it's called 
your Velcro self. Detach everything. Come to God. Forgive me. Repent. You, I'm going to say this as boldly as I can. You cannot receive God's grace and mercy without repentance. If you don't repent, which means you stop and turn the other direction, that grace isn't for you. Don't even touch it. You need to repent. You need to be after who God created you to be. You want to be a soldier in God's kingdom? That's something you have to do. There is no other option. You want to be a citizen of the king? You want to be considered a son, adopted in, have all of the benefits? Then this is what you need to do. I want to give you guys the opportunity. If anybody here today... Can you put some more shit music on? If anybody here today has something that they're feeling trapped by, that they're feeling stuck with, that they're feeling they don't have the boldness to speak in, that they're feeling maybe their identity is tied to the wrong thing, I want to give you the opportunity. We're going to pray for you, and I want you to come up with boldness, and we will pray for you there, and we'll lay hands on you and watch God deliver you, because He gave us... spot, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come up and we're going to pray for you. The Bible says that we can lay hands on you and we can impart, impart healing, impart wisdom, and impart the grace of God. We, we have authority over demonic strongholds. We have authority over, over anything that is from the enemy's kingdom. And we want to give you the opportunity. If this is where you're at, I want you to come up. And if not, I want to take five minutes. I want you just to close your eyes and we're going to wait on God. Uh-oh. Mm -mm. mm -mm. Alright. I want you guys to take a couple of minutes and just close your eyes and wait on God. See what he's doing, okay? And if in that time you want prayer, come on up.
you're not used to waiting on God, it can be awkward to sit in silence. There's been a lot of times where I put worship music on and I just can't even pray. I just sit and listen. And eventually, Holy Spirit just falls. I'm going to give you a heads up. We are going to practice waiting on the Lord more as we start to grow. But I don't want you to just sit and wait. I want you to, to do it as though you're expecting an encounter. It's like that moment when you see that hockey player charging the net and you've got that breath, that moment, that pause before he shoots and you know that it's going to go in. There's that waiting with anticipation of who God is. I want to encourage you guys today. I'm going to pray for you and then we'll be done.